One million plant and animal species face extinction. We've lost 60% of terrestrial wildlife and 90% of the big ocean fish. 96% of all mammals on Earth are now domesticated livestock. I'm Ari Jackson. We've seen an incredible amount of biodiversity loss this past century. 23 species here in the U.S. were recently proposed for delisting due to extinction by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. 11 species in Hawaii and Guam, eight species of freshwater mussels, two species of birds, and two species of fish in North America. We're going to look at a few of the species we've lost to honor them and to learn how we can do better to protect life in the future, as well as learn about a campaign called 30 by 30, which seeks to halt biodiversity loss. First, we're going to learn about the O'o and other species lost in Hawaii. Let's take a listen to see what the O'o sounded like. Thanks so much for meeting with me. Happy to talk with you about this topic is near and dear to my heart. Hawaii is the endangered species capital of the world. We are the most remote landmass on the face of the planet. We're 2,000 miles in any direction from a continent. And so the biodiversity that we have here is extremely unique. We have one of the highest rates of endemism in the whole planet, which means the plants and animals that we have here are found nowhere else in the world. Because we have some of the highest rates of endemism, when we lose something, there are no replacements anywhere else in the world. Hello. Hi. For people who aren't familiar, what does propose for delisting due to extinction mean? Well, when a species is put on the endangered species list, it receives special protections under the endangered Species Act. And so when a species is delisted or removed from the Endangered Species Act, it means it no longer requires the protections. In the case of the species we're discussing today, they're being delisted because we determined through the best available science that they are extinct, that they no longer occur on this, this world. That's a really sad thing to do. It's a very profound loss to actually say that these things are gone. Generally speaking, the causes of species decline and extinction in Hawaii is from human activities such as land conversion and then also the introduction of non-native species that can drastically modify the habitats where these birds live. These species definitely had a role in the ecosystem. There's probably some pollination loss from the loss of these birds. The o'o bird is a black bird with these beautiful long yellow feathers that were at one time when the bird was abundant used in the adornment of the royalty. So I believe I was in fourth grade, I went on a field trip to the Bishop Museum and seeing the, the feather capes that the royalty used to wear and the docents told us that the reason why these birds are extinct now is because Hawaiians hunted them to extinction. I knew that was wrong when they were telling me it. I knew it in my heart that that was wrong. In those days, so it was the early 80s, there was an assumption and a bias that humans are intrinsically bad for nature. We now know, with more recent science that came out, that a lot of these birds didn't start going extinct until mosquitoes and black rats started showing up. Many other forest bird species are at risk from the avian malaria and right now Hawaiian forest birds are really having an ex extinction crisis because increases in temperature and changes in rainfall are expanding the range of the mosquitoes and so they're moving into what were previously safe habitats for the birds. We're exploring some tools to help manage mosquito populations, as well as captive care and translocation. From the perspective of indigenous peoples, biodiversity is extremely important because it's the foundation of our cultures. And so whenever we lose a species to extinction, it's not just a piece of biodiversity that the planet loses, that's a piece of our cultural heritage. We need to flip the script. We got to stop telling our children that they are the problem. We need to start telling the children that they are the solution. Behaviors are the problem and humanity is going to be the solution because humanity's already figured out how to coexist with nature such that biodiversity and humanity can co-thrive together in the same space. If we can be a model of how to do that again today, then we can become the solution. That's really powerful what you're saying. Just shifting of the mindset of thinking of ourselves as a part of nature rather than separate from it. Now we're going to learn about the ivory-billed woodpecker. Let's take a listen to hear what it sounded like. Thank you so much for meeting with me. You bet. Glad to do so. Irogre finds it. I am Aiwe Bakoje. The ivory-billed woodpecker we call Tohare Tohare 
was a symbol of the sun, a symbol of war, and of connection to the land. Of course, I love the hydration jug. It's so good. <laughs> it was the largest woodpecker in the U.S. and the second largest in North America. It was 18 to 20 inches in length and its wingspan was about 29 to 31 inches. It was called the Lord Godbird. It was so distinctive and large. People would see it out in the wild. Lord, oh God. Uh, it did the double knocking and what's called a Kent call, which kind of sounds like when you blow through a mouthpiece of a clarinet or a saxophone. The ivory billed woodpecker was important not only to the Iowa, but to all the Native American peoples who lived in its range. I don't think people understand the depth of feeling that we have for all these beings that used to share our world. It's kind of like when your mom dies that kind of thing that never really heals. If the last sighting was in the 40s, why hasn't it been declared extinct? People thought there were different sightings. Early 2000s, they had the Luno video that came out. Everyone thought that it was back. There was a lot of review of that video. It was concluded that it wasn't conclusive enough. I've heard that there's communities of birders who still look for the ivory bill. Yes, there are quite a few. There's always hope, and you know, I hope that people continue to look for it. Hello, how's it going? Yeah, I'm doing well. Do you think the ivory billed woodpecker is still out there? I do. I think they're extremely rare. This kayaker, Gene Sparling, posted something on a canoe club listserv. It's a really great description of an ivory bill. I flew down to Memphis on the second day. We had a sighting. We stupidly look at it, ivory bill. And the bird spooked. We abandoned our canoe and we're waist deep in water and climbing over fallen logs, ripping our clothes. I was trying to get a picture and it kept flying to the other side of a tree. And Bobby's big guy with a beard, you know, I just saw an ivory bill. And he started crying. <laughs> People called him Sobbing Bobby after that. So I, I had to go back to Cornell and to tell the director of the Lab of Ornithology. That launched the whole big Cornell search. Three or four days later, I was back there in the swamp with a small team. David Leneau, I, you may have seen that, that video he took. He had a camcorder running constantly. So you had some video of it? Yeah. So the video didn't count as proof. It was accepted by the Fish and Wildlife Service back then. It's now a new generation of administrators at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and at the state, too. When we put it on our pipes, it was not only that potential for protection of our own people and going to war, but also as we tied down the crest as representing peace. So when you pray, all the things on that pipe are part of a story. Well, there were seven of the ivory-billed woodpeckers through beaks on it. And that represented the seven pipes, the seven clans, the seven stars. So it was sort of like a microcosm of the universe. You're praying with the Creator for the well-being of your people, for all of life on Earth, really, that it will continue. Before it was little groups of people living on the land in ways that didn't impact the land. And now we make the land into what we want it to be and there's more and more of us, and so there's more and more we want, although I think there's a difference between what we want and what we need. Now we're going to learn about freshwater mussels. Hello, Andy, how's it going? Going well. <laughs> Once you kind of get into it and learn a little bit about the freshwater mussels, it's something that you kind of get addicted to. They're living rocks. They occur on the bottom of the stream bed. They filter feed. Freshwater mussel can filter about a liter of water per hour. Everyone needs clean water. If we lose our freshwater mussels, we're losing some of our capability to have clean water. And that affects humans just as much as it does the aquatic species that occur. Yeah, we're all connected, right? If things are not going so well for the mussels, that doesn't bode well for us either. With these eight mussels in particular, dams being built are one of the factors. Contaminants and development, climate change, Historically, you know, the freshwater mussels were harvested for the button industry before plastics. These are all different stressors that added to the extinction of these. Now we're going to learn about the 30 by 30 campaign. Thank you so much for chatting with me. Thank you so much for having me. 
So for someone who hasn't heard of 30 by 30, can you describe what it is? The 30 by 30 campaign is basically the efforts to protect at least 30% of our world's land and ocean by 2030. If we protect 30% of the planet, then we would be heading at a good direction of reverting the biodiversity loss. What would you say this biodiversity loss means for us as humans? I think that many people think about protection and about nature as something that is completely separate from our economies and it's actually Actually, the opposite. A Cambridge report found that the economic benefits of protecting 30% of the planet would create jobs and outweigh the costs of inaction by a ratio of at least 5 to 1. When we protect our nature, we're also tackling the climate crisis as well. Conserving 30% of land in strategic locations could safeguard 500 gigatons of carbon stored in vegetation and soil. What percentage of the earth and oceans is currently protected? Currently, only 15% of the world's land is protected and 7% of our ocean is protected in 2019. The president of Costa Rica first mentioned bringing countries together, supporting the 30 by 30. We are reaching 77 countries. We have also support from scientists and indigenous peoples. I think there's so much to learn from our indigenous people and local communities. And they have all the traditional knowledge of protecting our nature. For everyday people who don't want to see more species become extinct, what can we do? One of the most important things to do to protect species is to protect the habitat. They're totally tied to it. The more native species you can plant in your yards and your landscaping around your buildings in your community, the more it'll help to keep that native ecosystem whole. We need to protect water quality and the chemicals that we use on our lawns and on our crops. They, they all eventually wash into our streams and rivers. Ask for elected officials to do more on protection of biodiversity. Since these interviews, 95 countries have joined 30 by 30, including the United States, but there's still a lot of work to be done to meet this goal. Learn more about 30 by 30 and how your city or country can join with the link in the description.